Salman Sharif. And we have really great names in this symposium now. Last year we had a meeting in Istanbul. There, there were really a great faculty here. One of them was Max Ivy. He is one of my great mentors. Uh, Richard Asakar, dear friend, he never lost, uh, let us alone. Daniel Chopin was with us. Frank Schwab was with us. And also a, another great name from Italy, Claudio Lamartina was here. Bariano was also here. Zileli as a faculty, nearly we have the same faculty today. We also have uh, dear friend Levek and also Massini. I'd like to thank to everyone, every faculty member, and also for the attenders. So my topic is classification of uh, adult degenerative scoliosis. There are lots of classification systems. The first one has been described by Simons in 2001. He has divided the uh, adult scoliosis in two types, type one and type two. They recommend us a distraction and short uh, fusion in type one, the type uh, without rotation. And in type two, which has a rotation in the vertebrals, uh, they recommend us the long instrumentation and uh, to correct the deformity, they recommend us the derotation maneuvers. The IB classification, sorry, can everyone mute the mic, please? Sorry. What is that, sorry? Imad, can you do that? Thank you. Another classification system has been described by Imad. Can everybody mute the phone? mic, please? Imad? Uh, sir, I don't have control right now to mute everyone. Uh, Mehmet has the control. Mehmet, if you could give the control to Imad, it might be easier, please. Honor, you there? Yeah, I'm here. I think. Uh, okay, yeah, go on, please. Carry on. I think we okay. request everybody else to please mute themselves, please. Then uh, another classification system has been described by IB in 2005. According to IB classification, IB has described the adult degenerative scoliosis in uh, mainly in three groups. The first group is primary degenerative scoliosis. It's known as de novo scoliosis. And the cause of this uh, scoliosis is asymmetric disc degeneration. And also it causes asymmetric loads onto the vertebra. I got this paper, uh, this schema from IB's paper. The instability causes deformity and the deformity causes may progress in time. And this progression may cause stenosis and all of them is related to each other. There is a circle here and the beginner, the trigger of this mechanism is the asymmetric disc degeneration. <coughs> According to IV in type two, these are the idiopathic scoliosis cases that not have been treated in the adolescent age and it progresses in the adulthood. In type three, these are the uh, Pathophysiology uh, mechanisms that are extraspinal the causes, and in type three B, these are the these are caused by the spine, and it causes uh, adult degenerative scoliosis. Another classification system was described by Faldini, with stable and unstable uh, adult degenerative scoliosis. They recommend us some surgical techniques here. Then in the same year, Schwab has described another classification system. He has divided uh, adult degenerative scoliosis to types in five groups. They described lumbar lordosis modifiers and also subluxation and also global white balance modifiers. In the same year, SRS again described another classification system. At the end in 2012, this is the scoliosis and Schwab 
deformity classification. We know on this side the coronal curve types. We know the sagittal modifiers here. And if you uh, want less complication after the surgery, you have to bring your patient between these values here. Uh, John Charles has described the pelvic parameters very well here, so I'm passing it, and also Richard will talk about it. So we need ideal alignments, but what's the ideal alignment? Alignment. Uh, International Span Study Group has published a paper. If we have the ideal alignment, then why do we have implant failure and why do we need 50% revision surgeries? The answer is it depends patient to patient. So uh, if a patient has a high pelvic incidence that Levesque has mentioned this, uh, the pelvic tilt less than 20 degrees is too low. And if a patient has a low pelvic incidence, you have to get this pelvic tilt less than 10 degrees. So a paper from European Spine Study Group has been published. And in this paper, they describe the global alignment and proportion score. It's patient tailored. It depends to patient. They have described five subgroups here. One of them was retro relative pelvic version. All of these parameters are described according to patient's pelvic incidence. And they say that if you obey these rules, you may have less complication after the surgery. So uh, if you uh, look at the literature, if you compare the GAP and also the Schwab SRS uh, values, it's more reliable in the GAP score. They added also the H in this group, but it has some, it needs some things to add in on it because there are no comorbidities here. Uh, about the classification and also there is no coronal balance parameters in this uh, scoring system. At the end, if you sum all of the scores here, if you have a, a score greater than seven, it means you may have 95% complications. So we know from IV's classification about the etiopathogenesis of the adult degenerative scoliosis and we also know the natural history we nearly know something about the ideal alignment, but ideal alignment is still a question mark there. So we still don't know where we have to start or where we have to stop. So La Martina is with, with us. They have published a paper in European Spine Journal in 2014. I think this is really a good uh, classification system. It helps you to guide how you have to treat that patient. According to this uh, paper, the first three group is the balance group. The fourth one is the imbalance group. If the patient has a sagittal imbalance, it's type 4A. If they have both sagittal and coronal imbalance, it's type 4B. And their recommendation is, if you have a patient uh, that has a non-epical uh, pathology here, the only thing that you have to do is only fuse that level. I'm passing this part. Uh, the paper is that has been published in European Spine Journal in 2014. Uh, they say that if a patient has a coronal and also sagittal balance, you have to correct it. And then you will need a surgery, a bigger surgery than the previous one. So uh, the lacking things in the previous one was the coronal balance. And another study that Again, Beriano, La Martina, and Obeid has been published. They have also added the coronal imbalance here. According to this paper, if you have a type 1, it means if you uh, draw a line, and if this line uh, passes on the concave side, it's type 1. If you have a coronal imbalance that passes on the convex side, it's type 2. And they have uh, described some treatment modifiers. Uh, according to that, uh, if the main curve is flexible or rigid, and they also take care for the lumbosacral junction here, the mobile, mobile and the rigid system. And then they described, uh, they have, they give us a good, good treatment oriented guide, guideline. So it's another good paper. We have to take consider for the also for the coronal imbalance here. So at last, the thing that I'm I can say we 
have to take for the Ethiopatagonians here. We have to know the natural history. We have to know the ideal alignment, but we have to put lots of things in it. We have to take care for the age and also for the comorbidities here. That's all, Salman Zileli. Hello. Hi, good. Uh, actually, uh, are there questions from the participants? Maybe there are two great names. All of them are great, but Ivy and Lamartina is here. So maybe Ivy wants to say something about the classification, maybe about his yeah. own classification system. And also maybe La Martina. And I think La Martina and his group is uh, preparing for a new classification system, I think. About putting, <laughs> because they are doing every year, every year new things. They add new things on it. You get confused, you mean? No, no. Every year <laughs> they put a coronal imbalance here because the lacking system, the lacking thing on the classification system is the coronal imbalance. They have added a coronal imbalance at 2019. And I guess, and I think they are preparing a new classification system that involves the coronal imbalance there. Dr. Max, I have, do you want to say something? No, it's a surprise. Um, I cannot anticipate this. <laughs> no, I think um, Yaman did a great, great job. But you know, this whole issue about the classification is that even now in 2020, when I have to review papers, you know, people still mix up the etiologies, you know, a scoliosis in adult life, which is a Idiopathic scoliosis, which comes from adolescence but has not been treated in, in adolescence, is completely different from a de novo scoliosis, which we most treat now, these patients, these elderly patients. And I mean, you can measure whatever you want to measure. You have to understand the pathophysiology of these curves. And these curves are very, very different depending from the etiology. And I think a classification which only looks at, at, at uh, measurable parameters will not really solve the problem. We have to understand what is the kind of scoliosis, what is behind that. And, and this is very important. Still today, after it's now 15 years we published this, and I read in new papers, now in this year, people who mix up everything. Just yesterday I read a paper where they talk about the, the proximal junctional um, uh, kyphosis and they have analyzed 80% of dead patients are idiopathic scoliosis. But an idiopathic scoliosis has a completely different impact on the proximal junctional kyphosis. So I think it's very important that all we are aware that we have to look first before we start to measure and to do this thing, what is the etiology of the scoliosis? What is the nature of the scoliosis? I don't know, but maybe um, uh, Claudio can, can uh, um, talk about this uh, better than me, but I, I still feel this is a, a mixture of, of deformities we put all in the same pot, you know. Yeah. Can we get the comment of Dr. Lamartina? Claudio? You can unmute yourself. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. I, I, now I, I can... I can. Yeah. I'm also my, myself. Uh, I totally agree with Max. Uh, I, de novo scoliosis and uh, idiopathic scoliosis, even if are both in, in adult, are two different two different animals. That means the the, the, the first de novo scoliosis is a very short uh, deformity in coronal plane, but also uh, in the sagittal plane. Uh, very often the main problem is in sagittal, not in, in coronal. Uh, vice versa, in, in case of adult idiopathic scoliosis, very often the problem is uh, eventually in the sagittal plane uh, because of uh, thoracolumbar kyphosis, but it's different. 
And very often, in case of idiopathic scoliosis, the compensatory mechanisms are not so strong like in idiopathic, in de novo scoliosis. And this is a relevant uh, not only for, for semantic reason, but also practically because the surgery very often is different. If you have to treat the novo scoliosis, very often you have to include the pelvis. Uh, and this is a, a, a big problem for, for the patient. Uh, vice versa, in uh, uh, adult idiopathic scoliosis, often you can leave free the lumbar sacral area. Uh, uh, this is the reason why I, I totally agree with, with Max. We have to pay attention, we have to avoid it to put in the same salad everything. At the end, we will not uh, have the chance to, to better uh, in uh, and the inappropriate way operate the, the patient. What, what do you think that one of our friend, friends from Portuguese, Paula Pereira, is telling that where are if there are too many classifications, it means that no one is good or, or simple enough. And then he gives the example from neurosurgery. The Glasgow Coma Scale has not changed for about 40 years because it's good enough. Uh, so then if you are changing uh, some uh, scorings uh, every uh, 10 years, then we have something uh, not understood probably. What do you think? But if I can, if I can give a, a comment about this very, very hot topic, in my opinion, an ideal classification doesn't assist, obviously, because it should be simple, should be comprehensive, should be treatment oriented, and so on. That means for easy to remember. That means this is impossible to 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 to, to create. Uh, we have to, to accept uh, uh, different classification just for, for this reason. But in my opinion, the best is to be less comprehensive, but uh, more, more simple. And in the same time, we should to, to, to create treatment-oriented classification. But in every case, an ideal classification doesn't exist. Doesn't exist, yes. May I say something? Yes, please. Oh, no. uh, IB's classification yes, okay. is a well-described classification and everyone who wants to learn the deformity surgery has to read that paper because it gives you very clear didactic points that causes the etiopathology and the nature of the uh, adult degenerative scoliosis. We have talked with Max IB. I told him we have to classify a new system and he then told me that then do it but it's really hard to do that because there are lots of uh, functions that's multifactorial and all the measurements that we are doing uh, are not well enough and uh, you have to consider the sagittal the coronal the hip the knee so the difficulty to identify the new classification is that because there are multifactorial things here. Okay. Okay. Salman, you can say speak? Yes, I think so. I think our next Claudio, speaker. Salman, Claudio, you want to say something? Yes, yeah. Claudio, you want to say something? Yes, please. Yes, please. Yes, please. Actually, in, in, in 1914, in the 2014, when we published the classification uh, previously mentioned, uh, we publish also one other classification in uh, uh, dedicated to, to the, the sagittal alignment, correlated to, to the compensatory mechanism. Once again, a treated, treated oriented classification. And we, we uh, decided to separate these two classifications just because if you try to put together, at the end you will have at least 50, 60 different uh, uh, type of uh, a curve of deformity that you, you should consider. This is the, the main problem with the classification. If you want to be simple, you have to uh, uh, reduce your, your, you have to focus one or two uh, key points, no more. 
if you try to be comprehensive, at the end you will have a huge unuseful classification with a lot of uh, uh, different types. Uh, it's impossible to, to remember this. Maybe in the future with the uh, intelligence, artificial intelligence, we should to try to, to put together different classification. Uh, actually, this is what we are trying to do. But the problem remains, if you want to be simple, you have to uh, focus in, in two, uh, no more than two key points. Okay, that was brilliant. Thank you for the, those comments. Uh, we're going to move on. Uh, I think in the interest of time, we're running late. 